Okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Visiting Artist Lecture Series for Spring 2021. I want to encourage you to visit the Art and Art History website for more information about this historic program and all upcoming presentations, including the next lecture in the series by Miguel Rivera on April 6th. My name is Dennis Doyle, a first year MFA student in the sculpture and post-studio practice area. This presentation will include the artist talk followed by a short Q&A moderated by me. Once the presentation is finished, please type your questions into the chat box to the right of the video on YouTube. Today, we are honored to be joined by artist, educator, and human rights activist, Sana Musasama. Sana grew up and received her advanced degrees in New York, a BA from the City College of New York, and an MFA in ceramic from Alfred University. Following her time at university, Sana turned her gaze out into the world to see other ways to further her education. Citing clay as a geographical catalyst, Sana traveled to Sierra Leone, Japan, China, Cambodia, and elsewhere, expanding her knowledge of ceramics, adornment practices, and other artistic mediums of communities across the globe. Sana's activism and multimedia artwork is deeply engaged in social justice, illuminating issues around, advocating for, and creating opportunities for the safety of women globally. Her work can be found in collections across the US and abroad in China, Holland, and Israel, to only name a few. Sana is the recipient of so many fellowships and awards, notably the Outstanding Achievement Award from INSICA, the National Council on, on Education of the Ceramic Arts, during their 2018 conference hosted in my hometown of Pittsburgh. Today, Sana is still based in New York when not traveling and has been a professor of ceramic art at Hunter College, the John Jay College of Criminal Justice, New Jersey City University. Sana states that a grounding of her work is storytelling, of narratives she heard in her childhood home in New York to those shared near kitchens and kilns across the world. Mm -hmm. Sana, we are so lucky that your story lands us here, lands you here with us tonight and are very eager to listen to the narratives you have to tell. So everyone, please join me in a warm welcome to Sana Musasama. Oh, thank you so much. What a beautiful, beautiful introduction. I got lost in the last part of it. It was so beautiful. It was like a poem. Thank you very, very much. Very, very happy to be here um, with everyone here in this virtual audience. And um, I want to just give a little special shout out to Kim Dickey. We were in graduate school together over 30 something years ago. And I often tell students that the classroom is fertile ground. It is in the classroom that you will make links and friendships for life. And, 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 and that's what Kim has been for me, a friendship for life. So thank you and all the others that are responsible for me being here to share with you um, this evening. So I'm going to go through a lot of images and not talk about a lot of them, but put them into a sequence of groups. And I'm going to start off with the, the travels because I feel that as a, a woman, as a, a, an activist, it's really traveling around the world that really centered and grounded me and maybe became, made me become introspective and begin to look at the life that I came from and look at the life that's out in the world. Um, I began to travel to test some of the truths of what I grew up with, with my four sisters against the truths out in the world. And I saw difference, radical differences. And sometimes that difference is if it's heart steppingly painful. One of the things I do as a solo traveler is I go to markets and I go to markets first because they're dominated by women all over the world. And walking into a market a few days, most of the time I just get silenced because I'm radically different from anybody there. My hair is different. I'm walking different. I'm dressing different. But usually on the fourth or fifth day, somebody will say, sister, sister, come sit here. Tell me your story. Who are you? Where is your mother? And what begins is a friendship and a friendship that I hold on to for a lifetime. So in these images that I'm showing you, some of them are Vietnam, some of them are Laos, some of them are Cambodia, some of them are Israel, some of the United States, some of them are 
three years old and some of them are 50 years old. So these are long, long, long journeys of places and always, always starting where women are. Women look out for women from other parts of the world and they always want to know where is your mother to let you roam around by yourself? So markets is the first place I go. I meet a woman, I start learning how to count. I start playing around with the language. She has a daughter, her daughter becomes my guide. She travels with me to the next village. I bring her back and there begins a relationship that lasts a lifetime. So a lot of these little girls that started off as my guides when they were just probably seven, eight, nine years old are probably now in their forties and their fifties right now. And something very beautiful about my roles with these little girls that become my guides is that in some cases I'm their mother as they lead me through village life. And then it switches like the seasons and they become my mothers and they become more adult-like about things that I would not be aware of in their culture that would endanger me. This, this is a beautiful image here. And what it is, it's a, a, always on the road, clay is everywhere. It comes in as many colors and personalities as we do as people. And so I stop sometimes and I make artwork and I ship it home to myself. And so this is a damp room. This is a room that's made out of broken shards and previous pots that have cracks in them. And it's a room where you put pieces in to let them slowly dry. Otherwise they dry too rapidly in the intense um, sun. So that's what was so beautiful that recycling something that 25 years in our existence has been going on in developing countries from the beginning of time. And that's my beading teacher when I went to Kenya to learn how to bead. So these are just different stands in the markets where I stand and I watch how people prepare food. Um, I um, learn how to prepare it myself. I'm also checking for things of hygienic things, if things are clean enough for me to eat, I'm by myself, I, I can't get sick. And so I'm observing all of these things, but more importantly, I'm learning how to count. I'm learning how many three cars, four count, six count, and I know how to exactly get the amount of money and start to juggle and play around with the vendor. So these are all different villages in different parts of the world. Um, where I first started traveling in West Africa, that image there in the far corner on my left at the bottom that I'm drinking water. I was 20, probably 26 years of um, age at the time. So that was a very, very long time ago. And that guy in the center is named Lahai and it's his village that I went to live in for nine and a half months. And above is a woman in Vietnam. And I purely go to this floating market to have soup with her once a week. And it's not so much that the soup tastes so good. It's just so, I just love the way that she smiles at me and the way that we communicate through sign and symbol. So markets, a lot of the places I go in the world are gender restricted. So I'm moving and doing what women do to be safe. I'm observing, I'm asking questions, I'm keeping a journal. I'm writing down what's difficult and unbearable for me to talk about or to ask things about to learn about later on, to research later on. I'm looking at tools, how people use their bodies, the landscape, how it blends in with people's lives, how people's lives are dictated by the seasons, how they move around, what their tools are, how people look into each other's eyes or don't look into each other's eyes, how they eat, how they sit. All of these things are, are very fascinating and fertile ground for me. And I'm always learning um, the language and I'm also, also interested in being an instrument of a learning tool where my hair is radically different in parts of the world. So people are curious about, is it real? Does it grow out of my scalp? And so I'm patient and understanding that my difference is not so radical if we bridge the gap. And so I'm letting people touch my hair at the same time I'm touching theirs. I'm also loving their daughters and spending a tremendous amount of time with their daughters that are teaching me the language and taking me to markets and teaching me how to barter and how to shop. So these wonderful experiences of how to make the clay from the earth and thank the gods for putting it there and for little girls becoming my, my mommy and, 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 and me their daughter and teaching me the language and, and, and trusting my instincts of what were right or wrong was pretty much the way I used all of my travel experiences and also the way that I chose to 
teach my students about taking risk and not having secrets and going beyond their comfort zones of what they know, having friends and colleagues of different nationalities and races and religions, and not to fear difference. My father made a career out of the military and a military base was not very far from me. So my dining room table stories were told of people from around the world in different languages were spoken and different foods were eaten and different clothing were worn. And so I grew up with this love of difference instead of a fear of difference. So it wasn't hard for me to begin to travel around the world 30 years ago and start to begin to see and test. These are a little bit of the images of things that I saw that found their way onto the skin of my pieces. So that was the rice patties in, in Vietnam. This is the Akea bush, which is a sharp needle that is used for stitching and sewing and also used in female excision. This is the landscape in Kenya where I went to learn beadwork, which I ended up hating <laughs> to do. And so instead I made pots and put the landscape on the surfaces of my pots and said the hell with beads. This is the temples in Burma and the excreto, uh, uh, scrofito lines with the soil that's inlaid and how it's on the surface of one of my pots. And this is my girlfriend's daughter's corn house where she will make dry the corn and make meal. And this is my interpretation of that form and baskets, which are considered the mama of pottery. I'm always looking at basket forms. They came first. They were lined with clay or mud. A basket caught on fire. There began to see petrified clay. And so I'm always looking at baskets and looking at the weaving patterns in them that gave birth to the markings on some of the pots. And here are markets that I'm always traveling in because they're dominated. And some of the information that I may take, this is cinnamon on the side of a road. And this is where I took dried leaves. And it's also the smile on this woman's face here is also on, um, on my piece as well. Her wonderful, wonderful smile, a hill tribe woman. And these, po this, these pots, not these pots, these cabbages that are compressed between this truck en route to a market to sell. And this idea of something compressed so tight with just a, just a little bit of air just makes my skin crawl and, and makes me have this feeling of anxiety. And so I love compressing the walls within the clay and where it turns me back to a time period of being uncomfortable or crossing a river or something uneasy. So the travels for me are joyous uh, events and journeys, but they're also sometimes somewhat scary and somewhat dangerous. And so I keep these books and drawings of everything I do. A lot of times I study the language before I travel someplace, but not all the time do I understand or am I understood <laughs> because a lot of languages are tonal. So one learns when you're traveling to sign and symbol and you learn to see with your eyes, your lens. And so I began to identify uh, a hill tribe persons by their dress, the Maasai people who wear dominant red. I began to identify this woman during adornment uh, practices that she has the wheat grain that's adorned her hair to show uh, to a suitor, to a young man that she's interested in, that she can make bread. And that little boy that has the deer horn on the top of his head, he's showing everyone that he's a hunter and that he can provide meat. And then the Viet Cong hat that had tremendous symbolic uh, symbols for us during the 60s, particularly during my generation of the Vietnam War. And there it, it becomes something that keeps the sun off of your face. But at one point it distinguished the Viet Cong uh, from North and South. And then here, this wonderful thing of play. This is a beetle that this young friend son has a string tied around the beetle's leg. And the beetle's about the size of the palm of our hand. And the beetle's exhausted because he's been on the string all day long, acting like an airplane. And this is what this child is playing with. This little child doesn't have a plastic toy. This child is making a toy with what's in their own environment. And so I'm there at the end of the day, the beetle's exhausted. He takes the string off the beetle's leg. He gives the beetle some melon. The beetle eats it all up and waddles away and then flies away. And I'm just charmed by this. And then over in the far corner here, are these weights that her, his brother has drilled a, 
a hole through made a dowel and he's lifting up his weight. So this kind of thing about play and improvising and creating is an instinct that we all have regardless to our economics and wherever we are in the world. And I love seeing that. So I love seeing markings that I've always carved on the sides of my pots, but yet I walk into a kitchen in Africa and that carving is right on the wall. And I say, how can that be? Or watching a dance that I was told a ritual, it was a dance of initiation in adulthood. And then I take dance classes here and learn the dances, the dance of war. And then a woman's breast being painted so elaborately, and her face also elaborately painted, that's depicting, I can give you many children, I can breastfeed, and also the patterns that exaggerate the, the cheek, her cheekbones and her jawbone, and clothing that depict what tribe and identity I belong to. What is my language? What is my grandmother's language? Everything that you're looking at, I own every bit of it. I love these clothing, but I would never wear them in the country that they're there because they talk about a person saying, I am uh, Yiddish, I am Caribbean, I am Black American, I am Irish. They speak of thousands and thousands of years of history and therefore they are their identity wrapped in their clothing. And so I love these things, but I respect not to wear them there. So these are all hill tribes along with the golden triangle. And these are also hill tribes and all of these are clothing based on identity or sign and symbol. And this is a, a place where you go to get your hair cut and um, because many tribes will end up at, at market day at this place and not everybody speaks the same language, there's a picture book that has some of these haircuts in it. And so you just point to the haircut that you want and you sit down and there is no need to even have a dialogue. And it's the same thing with the doctor. He has a big book and it has pictures of things in there. So if you have diarrhea, there's somebody in a picture squatting with liquid coming from their butt and you point to it and he has medicine for you. It, it's, 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 um, um, it's a, a, a humorous, beautiful, and so practical and sensible thing. One medicine can cure so many different things. It just depends upon the dosage of it, which was is, was so interesting for me. These are just a few images. I worked in the felony defenders program for 16 years and I worked with felons, kids between the ages of 14 and 17. All of them had been to jail. The organization I worked to, with took them out of jail and we kept them for five years and we put them in GED programs and we taught them life skills, reading and writing, the computer, and we also did the arts. And fortunately, here's another story. The person who hired me to work for cases was also somebody that I was in graduate school with, Roy Steele. And um, I saw some tables on the street from Starbucks that was throwing them out and I grabbed them and took them to the uh, place the incarceration center got some tiles and we began making these tables and began making art in public places. So it's the beginning of me taking kids and deconstructing or de-mentalizing and, and, and a mentality of gang and, and warfare and making art with it and putting it in a public place where we all share from it. So it was a wonderful project. I worked there for 16 years. I did the tables for about maybe five years and they're in lower Manhattan near Ground Zero and the Starbucks that are there. And here are a, a series of trees that I did, uh, I did for 10 years. I stay on a series for a long time because I travel with the series and also I work in multiple jobs. I have sisters, nieces and nephews. I'm a community person, so it takes me time. And I'm not always in the studio. My studio practice is, is divided into seasons. There's seasons when I'm writing grants. There's seasons when I'm teaching. There's seasons when I'm producing. There's seasons when I'm gardening. I have to chop it up that way. I'm not able to multitask without making a disaster of, of things. So these are trees based on a social political symbol where the tree made sap which made sugar, which made medicine. And human beings did not have to be taken from the transatlantic and brought over to the United States and filtered out to the islands to work on the sugarcane plantations. This was an incredibly beautiful story where the tree was used as a social and political symbol to speak out against the injustices of slavery. And so if you see on them, the hand is used over and over. It's the bark 
it's the texture on the tree, it's the patterns of the leaf over and over because in most genocides, it is the human hand that's valued, not the heart, not the brain, not the soul of the person, but the hand. Without the use of the hand, you're useless. And so you see the hand being used in a lot of these pieces in the roots of, of them. And I made, I worked on them for 10 years and made about 60 of them. They range from two feet to about maybe uh, eight feet, depending upon kilns. Some are in one form and some are in two forms. They're made with whatever clay body I could find where I was in the world. And having studios around the world has always worked to my advantage. I love trying traveling and I can ship four or five sculptures home. Well, I did ship five or six sculptures home from Holland. Just say the ones that you're looking at right now in crates by boat. It took three months. I think it cost me about maybe $500 to send one of them from my queen's residence to a show in Philadelphia, it would cost me $1,000. So far more economical for me working in other parts of the world. Plus I get a chance to travel. I get a chance to learn a, a language. I get a chance to make other kinds of friendships. So these are all part of the, the, the Maple uh, Tree Series. Um, so um, this is a, a statement. It says, I participate in a process of feminist art, which is based upon uncovering and speaking in present and talking about the stories of women, predominantly women. And why it's predominantly women is as a woman traveler, as someone who started traveling in my 20s, traveling by myself, not all the time having enough money, not all the time learning the language. It was little girls, it was women in other cultures that said, get off this train tonight, somebody will harm you. Don't put your feet in that water. Sister, come home with me, do not go in that direction. Sister, do not live in that hut, men will come there. It is women and little girls that began to protect and take care of me. And it's their lives that I began to watch and I began to watch it very carefully. So this little girl here with this little pan on the back of her head, this photograph is probably 45, 50 years old. So she's an adult woman if she's alive. And she was assigned to take me to the market one day when I couldn't find it on my own. And I was, I'm sure, 25, 26 years old. And when they sent her to my hut and I looked down at her and she said, come, I couldn't believe it. And I just said, listen to her and just followed her. And above is Jenna, a wonderful, playful young lady who was teaching me the language and just, just women friends of mine that I lived around who protected me and always children because their mothers were busy working and, and doing other kinds of things. So their children had the time to be around me all the time and they could handle tools and, and they could do work before they would go to school and they would have a baby on their back that would be two or three years, uh, two or three weeks old. And um, they were just powerful young women. They could barter and shop and, and feist back at somebody who was trying to take advantage of me. They were like, little angels in, in my midst. And so it's their lives that I began to pay close attention to. And it's their lives that I began to tell stories about. I began to be exposed to female excision, a ritualistic surgery that we hear about is coming from West Africa, but it comes from many, many, many nomadic tribes around the world have manipulated and altered the vaginal parts of a woman. It is a surgery that existed right in the United States here. My aunt was a nurse at Creedmoor State Hospital hospital and it was a procedure that was done on the mentally insane women to to somewhat calm the spirit on the nerves of a woman who was violent. Men were given lobotomies and women were circumcised. And so um, practice with a lot of nomadic people as a hygienic practice. So anyway, um, it's, it has a long history and these are pieces I began to make. And I lived in China for a little bit of time doing ceramics and I began to study the bound foot. And so, so many parallels between the rituals all over the world around women's issues of how to sit, how to speak, how to be silent, how not to be seen, how to be docile. And I saw parallels cross-cultural. And so the bound foot has so much, so similar rites of passage to the female excision 
being quiet, being docile, being ladylike, walking a certain way, sitting a certain way, having a very, very low sexual drive. And so I began to make pieces that are about that as, as well. And, and when in China, I gathered the shoes of women who at one point had their feet bound. This was outlawed with the cultural revolution and female excision is also outlawed. It's just not always enforced. So at one point they were all the size of our faces and then they got reduced to this scale and became very um, small uh, forms. And a lot of the reason why they went from this size to this size is that this was secret society in many cultures for 7,000 of years. No girl knew when she was going to have this incredible ritual done for her. Um, it was all secret. No girl plays who's 12 plays with a girl who's 14. Um, the other thing that I want to also say about the, these rituals these rituals are really a lot have a lot to do with being female with being safe in traditional cultures for ha for having the same class issues for having the same beauty issues or certainly for being loved and respected for being like every woman before you they're about strength they're about endurance they're about power unfortunately they are about harm and they are about um pain and in some cases they are sometimes a about people losing uh, their life. But in studying about this ritual, what was important for me was not to only listen to the voices of Westerners and their opinions about this procedure, but to read and listen to the voices of women and men who have gone through these procedures. Listen to their sentiments first before I listen to what ours are and get a rounded picture about what it is. You're seeing a compressed rose petal because in, in some parts of the African culture, the clitoris is considered the rose. It's like a rose butt with all these little petals that are around here. And so this is where I've compressed it and it's a drip. And this is where, uh, un unfortunately, in some rituals of uh, female excision, a girl is cut too deeply and she she hemorrhages to death. And these rituals, um, the piercing, the body painting, they, a lot of them are about persevering life and, and having idiosyncrasies that are grounded in, in your gender. They're about having a certain kind of power. A woman who had bound feet could flirt. A woman who'd been circumcised could eat meat for the first time. They're purely about being female and being celebrated for the first time in your life for being a female. They're about taboo and silence and hygiene. They're about a perseverance about life and being proud. Um, um, in working in the incarceration center, I began to be exposed to children that were coming through the forced secure system. And it was a population that I was never aware of until I began working in the incarceration center. About 70% of young girls that walk out of forced secure walk into the hands of a pimp. 3,000 girls come into New York City a day and that are filtered off into different parts of the boroughs or even to tri-state areas and get involved in the sex industry. Some against their will, some runaways, some coming from drug countries, drug infested families, some are mental illness. So I began to begin to look at this population and it took me to Cambodia to the Somali Mom One Foundation. And this is the beginning of uh, this um, kind of journey that has lasted now um, 14 years. And what I tell my students all the time is that, that you don't have to be um, um, a feminist. Um, uh, you don't have to be a woman. You don't have to be a Marxist. <laughs> None of these to, to protest violence against women, children, little girls, or another human being. All you have to do is be human. That's all you have to be. And that's something every single one of us are, is human. So it's not about knowing these theories. It's not about having this political awareness. It's about just being human. So this is me in Cambodia working with girls who were once abducted, lured, and pulled into the sex industry against their will. And I read about it in that glamour magazine that you see up there. I took that to Cambodia as my passport to show girls that the woman who is traveling around the world 
talking about them is writing about them and telling people about these girls who are trapped, who are sold, um, sometimes by a parent, by a neighbor, by a brother. Sometimes they're runaway girls that don't want to live in the countrysides anymore and they come to the city and the wrong person gets them. They think they're going to get into a situation they can get out of and they can't. They're children and they make children mistakes. Somali rescues them. She's rescued maybe 10,000 girls to this day. And when I read this story about her, I felt compelled to be a part of their healing process. I worked with a population of girls in New York that were broken and I saw them heal through a process of making art through art therapists. I decided maybe that I would go there. So the girls in New York took gifts of dolls and I went there and I met 81 girls 14 years ago. And to be honest, when I went the first time, I only went to go one time. But once I entered into the daily ritual of 17 days of working with 81 girls, I knew that this was something that I was going to do for the rest of my life, is fight sex trafficking, whether it's in Cambodia or whether it's in my home state of New York, but be a part of the life of a girl who's coming back from a death sentence. So the first year we made dolls, and the next year we made pocketbooks, and then the next year we made slippers, and then the next year we did paper baskets, and then the next year I had them teach me something. And then we began to make aprons. I met this woman in Cambodia and I love her saying, in the end when all is done, they cannot say that I did nothing. She started an orphanage for children who live on the streets. These are signs that are progressively coming up in Cambodia and lots of parts of the world where sex trafficking is an institution is these signs. I look for these signs and they keep me from staying in certain hotels that do not have these signs. I went to Cambodia to work with girls who were once lured into the sex industry, but Cambodia had something else for me to learn about that I did not learn about when I should have been learning about in the classroom, and that was the Cameroon Rouge. That genocide that lasted six years that killed five million people, I was oblivious to. I was maybe 22, I didn't read about it. It wasn't covered in my classrooms, but this genocide was going on while I, we, all of us are about our lives doing what we do. And these inequities are happening all the time and some place in the world and inequities happening right now that we're not reading about and we will find out about it or we'll know somebody who'll care about it. But this is what I saw when I went to Cambodia and it broke my soul in two these images of clothing of people who are derobed before they're murdered, torture beds, signs to be quiet, bodies decaying. And I began to make work about it. I would go with my friends in the morning as they would pick up shards of things that they thought belonged to their loved one that they have never found. And I began to make work about it. Who's my work for? My work is for us. My audience is my community. It's my students. It's my family. It's my world. It's not a, a woman whose foot is bound. It's not a girl soldier. It's not a, um, a girl who's been trafficked. It's to tell the stories that we don't live as Westerners because we're fortunate, before we have, because we have a safety net that catches us when we make mistakes and the, we don't ever fall to the bottom that some of these girls have fallen. So these are all pieces that came out of looking at what Cambodia had for me. And then I began the Apen Project and I'm almost done. And what happens with Somali's project is she rescues girls at one point between the ages of 13 and 21. And now girls are getting younger and younger and younger and younger to the point now where she's rescuing them as young as three and four. Um, three and four is better because they haven't been victimized in a brothel. Older they've been victimized and they have a lot more healing to go through. Older means they can't sit in a classroom if they stopped going to school in the fourth, fifth grade. So what happened is I began recognizing on the streets in the evening that the older girls who were rescued at 15, 17, 18, don't get the formal education that a six-year-old, seven-year-old, 10-year-old uh, um, get, and they flounder. 
the skills that they get of cooking, sewing, fish farming, self-defense, doing hair are not enough skills and, and it's not enough to make a living. And so I started an apron project. Every January 2nd, I'm in Cambodia and it's the day that my mother died. And I think of my mother who was a domestic and I found one, of, I live in the house I grew up in and I found one of her aprons. And I took them there one year that day and I said, why don't we make aprons in memory of my mom? This will be the extra income that you girls need to make because you don't have the formal education behind you. This will supplement a job that you already have and thus began the apron project. It's about eight or nine years old. These are the girls that are in the, the apron project. When they started, they were 14, 15. Now they're in their thirties. They're now mothers. They're fishermen, fisherwomen, um, they're cooks, um, they're social workers. Um, and here are just a few images of, I now take my own body of work there. I'm working on a, a, a series called Topsy Turvy Dolls. And I have a, 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 a population of women in Phnom Penh, another state that I take my dolls to, and we make these dresses to them at some point they'll be spinning on a wall. And instead of a topsy-turvy being about a black doll and a white doll during antebellum, they're really more about historical women in my life whose shoulders I stand on as a black American artist. And these are I See Me dolls. It's a wonderful doll about a story about growing up in St. Albans, Queens and looking like a little African girl and wanting to be considered beautiful and a world that wanted to see black girls beautiful when they're very light skinned with Matisse hair. And my mother made a doll and said, I'm gonna make a doll that looks like you and the I see me dolls. And so I started making a series of these dolls and really have had a lot of time playing around with Raku. And here's another topsy turvy doll. What they will do is spin on the wall and you'll see only one image at a time of the dolls. And then I just have just, um, some work that I'm working on. My mother was blind in my late teens and she began to learn Braille. And I live in the house and every now and then I, a memory comes up about making things about her. And so I started making these Braille tablets that are around the house that also remind me of the aprons that she made when she was a domestic. And these are just images of beautiful objects that I see around the world that keep me going everywhere around the world all the time with my heart in my hand. Thank you very much, you guys. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, Sana, I was on mute. Um, Sana, thank you so much. That was an absolutely beautiful presentation. Um, we're gonna enter into the question and answer portion of the talk. Um, so for all of you watching, feel free to put your um, questions into the chat on YouTube off to the right, um, and I'll be able to read them and sort of have a discussion with Sana. Um, Sana, I'm gonna jump in and ask a question. Um, sure. You know, so much of your work is, and throughout this presentation, you're talking about sister and talking about mother. Um, and thinking about in your recent work in the apron project of using the form of the apron based off the design of your mother. How do you think about family in your practice and your work maybe as building family and building community? You know, that's, a, that's an interesting question you um, to be pondering and I'm thinking about it tremendously more so than I ever have during this pandemic because it's during this pandemic this idea of family didn't really mean anything during the pandemic. I didn't see my sisters who I for them for one year and my sisters live within 45 minutes because of the fear of being around each other and they have grandbabies. And because I taught hybrid and I was around students, even though I had a respirator on, they wouldn't come near me. So I began to really question what really is family and then the other thing is, it was my 14th year of not being in Cambodia. And every year is my mother's death transition day on January 2nd. The impact of feeling it this year was monumental, which made me realize that in Cambodia, 
it's like I tell my students, you cannot teach without being taught. You can't mother without being mothered back. So here I think in a lot of ways I'm mothering in Cambodia, but those girls are mothering me as well. So that's how I would answer that. They're, they're mothering me as well. So it's, 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 it's this thing going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So, um, yeah. I think that's really I, I, I thought, I've thought about it a long because um, I don't think I saw one person other than the male Marin for five months. And I unraveled in that isolation. I unraveled in that isolation. And then with the murders, I have a studio, a beautiful studio in the backyard. And every time I went into the studio, I, I told myself, the world doesn't need an artist now, Sana. The world needs a marcher. You need to march. That's what you need to do. And so I then took to the streets and marched. But now I know 11 months into it, the world needed both of them. It needed the son of the artist and it needed son of the marcher because the marching didn't heal me either. So this idea of family, I think that we have to constantly expand it and make it bigger and bigger and bigger all the time. And it has to go far beyond nucleus family. It must, it must go far beyond it. I saw my neighbors on both sides of me, but I didn't see my sisters. And mm -hmm. it, all of it was the pandemic. All of it was the pandemic, you know, so. Um, family took on another, a whole nother reshaping um, and something that I'll continue to really think about. I think about the girls in Cambodia as being an extended family and how I was particularly helpless if any of those girls ever got the virus. They all ran to the countryside, but I thought to myself, what could you really do from this end if something were to strike that whole entire village that the girls live in? So it's complicated, com very, 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 very complicated, you know? And sometimes, some, sometimes the career of being an artist keeps us away from our families too. We spend long, long hours in our studio practices, six and seven days a week. You know, uh, I can remember sisters calling me up and saying, Sana, it's your birthday, me not even being aware it's my birthday. Or Sana, are you coming to Thanksgiving dinner? We're waiting and I get up and run over there. So, you know, already our, our practice keeps us so solo sometimes in our studios. Uh, I think this idea of bringing family in and bringing community in and artist community and weaving institution and weaving artists together is something we really have to go th through uh, make big, big leaps forward going forward, uh, particularly since the pandemic reshaped that for us. It really, really did. Absolutely. And I think in your work, there's so much of reference to the body and also reference to a sense of touch of working with material and working with other people on material. Um, yeah. So I'm going to pop over to the chat for a couple questions. Um, Catherine was asking about sort of how you define what it means to be a feminist artist and do you feel it's the feeling of female power when making a work of representing femininity or maybe even thinking about ways in which of creating family of creating a, a sisterhood and a mothering I, I think it's a lot of different things for me and it varies from one place to another. And uh, somebody very interesting was telling me, you know, when, you, when, when I walk into a, a, a village that I'm going to be spending a couple of months there, I, I have done a lot of research in advance. And to be very honest with you, I unpack my luggage of feminism and I leave it right at the shore because it doesn't apply where I'm going. And I can't take my feminism the way that I breathe it and live it in the place that it was nurtured and impose it someplace else. I absolutely cannot do that. That would be another form of ism, which I don't even know, but it wouldn't be a good one. So um, what people will see in me is a woman who's independent, a woman who's fearless, a woman who's deeply curious and caring, a woman who asks questions, um, a woman who's tender, uh, a woman, woman um, who's respectful in the context of where I am in the world based on the way religion is practiced. Um, a woman who will 
stand back and watch and he'll keep returning. Now, what that will be called in Vietnam, what it will be called in Cambodia, what it would be called in Laos, I don't know, but here it would be shaped in a world of feminism because it's a form of power and freedom. And um, I can remember once in Vietnam 30 years ago, I used to visit the prisons and I remember visiting a woman who told me she crossed the border because she wanted to be like Sana. Well, she didn't, couldn't do be like Sana. So she, here she crossed from Vietnam into Thailand and here she was in immigration jail. So one must be very, very careful about how they move through the world and with their bodies and how they express where they come from with their feminism. I, I say don't back down when it comes to protecting your body and your stance on you will not let anybody harm you, but in imposing multiple systems that would only hurt that system, I leave those things out. I really do, I leave them out. I leave them out. Mm -hmm. I leave them out. Yeah, and I, th I think you mentioned something in the beginning of the talk of thinking about how truth, truths exist in the world and your truth and how your story mixes with other people's story. And um, a lot of your work of this process of travel, of observation, um, you know, how do you go from this observation, this learning, this being mothered to then making an artwork and presenting that to an audience that might not have heard this story before. What does that process look like for you? It's, it's, like, a, um, it's like a coffee percolating in a pot. The, the experience that I'll, I'll have will be one that's kind of heart shattering. It'll be one of the ones that just don't, won't go away. It's like a hiccup. I keep rethinking about it. It keeps coming up in my reading. It keeps coming up when I travel to another place. It keeps coming up where uh, something triggers this to make me think of this. And so with those kinds of experiences that I have, I then begin to write about them. And I write about them for a long time. And then I begin to study them. And then I begin to travel about them. And then it's when I feel this overwhelming presence that I have poetically called my extra, extra heartbeat. It's then that I pick, pick up my material and build. So my experience with living in West Africa uh, and living around girls who were going through the ritual of female excision and my picking up clay and making and talking about it is 19 years. It took 19 years of studying, growing up, traveling, understanding, asking questions, minding my own business, not minding all my business, talking back, asking more questions, more travel, until there was nothing else to do but to spit up this series and begin to talk about it. It was important enough that, and, and that's how they come about. They come about because they've been percolating for a very, 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 very long time. So the work that you may see coming in the studio now, the ideas are, are in numerous, numerous books that I've been writing about for about 10, sometimes 10 years. So it's not hard to begin to make them because they've been sketched, um, talked about in my head and placement and color and clay and season and I put enough information on that piece of paper that I could begin to begin building a, a piece and completing it. Yeah, and this actually connects kind of to a question Anne had of, you talked about just now and in, um, previously in the talk about having seasons for things of seasons of traveling, seasons of making, seasons of teaching. Um, could you talk more about that process and maybe what season you feel you're currently in? Oh God, I'm lost now. I'm in the season of lost. I'm in pandemic season. Um, um, it, normally how it works for me is between March and October is production time for me. It's when I'm in the studio and I'm pushing work 24 seven. It's seven days a week, whether it's morning or whether it's night. And then at that point, 
there's eight weeks of everything drying. And while everything is drying, that's when I'm then beginning to tweak some of the grants that I started to write to get those out. And also getting ready to teach my, um, my academic year. And then between November and January 1st, I'm pushing all those grants out and also firing the kilns. Also beginning to research more grants, also taking classes. I'm always taking language classes. I'm also trying to be a little more involved with my, uh, my uh, sisters as we get older. And then I also live in a neighborhood of, of seniors because everyone now is a senior now and doing that. And then um, a Christmas break, six weeks is, is Cambodia, Thailand and Laos. And then, the, then it starts again with March and April starts making again. So it just it, that's just the way it, it seems to rotate now. Now with me downsizing and no longer teaching I'm hoping that in 18 months, because I've lost a tremendous amount of money with the pandemic, that in 18 months, that my trips to Cambodia will be four months instead of six weeks. And in, in that four months, I want to really establish it as a place that runs. But I have to say that this year, I was tremendously, tremendously proud of the girls in the Apron Project. I was able to send the money over I watched them go to the markets with their mask on, buy fabric, show it to me in the, on a Zoom camera, give me the thumbs up. Is this good mom? Is this good mom? And I say, no, I hate it. And then they would giggle and find something else. And we got all this fabric. And, and then we had one day where they, we all sat out on, they sat on the floor and we put this together with this, the straps and that together. And then we had another day we called all eight girls in. And it started with me 11 o'clock at night with them Zooming me and talking to each girl finding out how each girl's year was, what they made, what I can't pick up this year, then going to each girl. I fell asleep probably at 12.30. I woke up at six o'clock in the morning. Six o'clock in the morning for me is six o'clock in the evening and they were still at it. It was the most beautiful thing to turn over in the bed and there was my iPad and I looked down and here they all are on the tile floor and they're wrapping their bundles and they're saying goodbye until next year. So they did it without me. They did the whole thing without me. And I was so concerned about them making money. I just sent the money Western Union and said, well, it, it'll work. And they did it. They did, they did a great job. Now my product is there. That's another story, but that's okay. The girls are living. They're buying rice. They're eating. They're, their children are not endangered. And my mother used to always say to me that I used to feel concerned that with the project that an apron project, how big a deal can it be? How many lives can it save? How many children can it send to school? And I would get anxious about looking at two and 300 aprons sitting on the, on the couch and not selling. And I'd be so anxious, I would hide them around the house. And then I just remember this really beautiful thing that my mother used to say, and I know she got it from someone else. She used to always take authorship of somebody else's words, but she would say that lives are not saved in bundles. They save one by one. So I think about that in Cambodia. I'm saving a girl one by one. And right now I've got eight. And out of these eight girls that I have, every one of them are mothers and none of their daughters will be sold. And so I've saved eight times two. <laughs> eight times two. None of their daughters will be sold. So that's bravo, bravo, bravo. Huge bravo. Mm -hmm. And Sona, we have found five minutes left. So we'll end with one last question. Sure. Uh, do you, um, Bailey asked, do you have any advice to give to aspiring young artists? Um, I say follow your passions, look for joy in life, recreate family all the time, be unstoppable and share. Be unstoppable and share. I think it's very, very important to share. We need to share and hold hands as human beings. It's very, 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 very important. I love in Cambodia, the girls call me sister. And I love that ex that expression that, you know, I'm, I'm sister. They only call me mom when I'm being firm with them about a decision they've done that wasn't wise and I'm mom. But other than that, I'm really sister. So I just kind of think that, you know, when I move through the world, 
when I see a little girl, she can be two years old, or I can see her mom and her mom can be 40. I can see her grandmother, her grandmother can be 60. I just feel like we're, we're all sisters. We're all sisters. That's so beautiful, Sana. I wanna thank you so much. And you're welcome. Thank you for, for sharing with us and being with us tonight. You're welcome, uh, you're very welcome. So if everyone in the, in the chat wants to give Sana a big thank you and a big round of applause. Um, thank you. We'll wrap the talk up there. Please tune in for future lectures. Please check out the Art and Art History website for future lectures. And a huge thank you to Sana for a wonderful talk tonight. And thank you very much, Dennis, too, for too, also. Very, very much. Of course. Okay, bye-bye, you guys. Good night. Good night.